PR LPO Infrastructure Summit 2016. Uh, good afternoon. I'll try and not have uh, Lakshman raise his hand, so I'll talk a bit fast. I usually do. Okay. My subject matter is PPPs and innovative business models. Sri Lanka's performance in PPPs, I don't want to use the word suck, but <laughs> actually quite terrible. In the last 17 years, in the last 17 years, we have financially closed only three PPPs of over $200 million. The first was SAGT of $225 million in 1999, during a time we had country risk and a, and a war risk premium attached to the country. Then came CICT, the container terminal where China Marine invested $550 million. That's operational at the moment. And then we have Port City, which was operational, then suspended, now back in action again, but that's still under implementation. So that would put the number of PPPs that are operational to only two that are over $200 million. And today's context, in Sri Lanka's economic context, $200 million is absolutely nothing. However, in the five years that the Bureau of Infrastructure Investment was set up by me, we financially closed $800 million of PPP projects during the time of where we had war risk, and that would cover not just ports, it covered telecom, it covered power, it covered mini hydro, it covered housing. So, so let's really look at ourselves very critically and realistically. Now, PPPs are very simply, there's a, there's a confusion about the definition of a PPP. In my view, it is a new investment in a sector where the GOSL government might have a stake, there might be an element of regulatory control, there may be a revenue guarantee like in a power project, and it is governed by a complex agreement, not just the BOI agreement, it's governed by a complex, what we call a concession agreement. Privatization of existing assets is not PPPs in my view, However, resuscitating white elephants in the form of a Matala port can be categorized, in my view, as a PPP. Now, if you go back to the early 1990s when the uh, government at the time embarked on PPPs initially, it was in, set up in the Treasury for two years, and not a single transaction was closed. And then USAID came in and said, we will provide technical assistance to the Board of Investment to set up the Bureau of Infrastructure Investment. And it was successful primarily because new skills were brought into the government. But th that was not all. There were three institutions that worked in tandem that fed each other and worked with a sense of cohesion that resulted in some remarkable things happening economically. First, we had PERC, the Privatization Commission, Public Enterprises Reform Commission, that was set up through a statute to privatize existing assets. Then we had the BII to set up new assets and new investments as public-private partnerships. Then we had what was called the PSIDC, Public Sector Infrastructure Development Company, that provided long-term loans for either privatized assets or new assets that were set up under the BII. It had common boards, it had private sector representatives, and worked in tandem. So, if you're asking the question, why we are not performing well, my, my, my only answer to that, look at the history, what worked? Simply replicate that, because the laws are still there. The, my, 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 my own contention is that really very little new legislation is necessary if at all, though I do understand the world has evolved over the last 17 years. One more important point. In the entirety of the $800 million that was financially closed as PPPs, there was not even one unsolicited proposal. All of them were solicited through the preparation of RFP documents, complex requests for proposal documents. So I frankly fail to understand the government's initiative of introducing what is called the Swiss challenge for unsolicited proposals because I think we are just opening a Pandora's box if we, pro if, if we progress in that, in that particular route. Let's look at how things were done and my, since the focus of my presentation on financing, SAGT for example, to fast forward 17 years, it was financed with a MEGA guarantee, as was mentioned uh, by Kamal. Again, as I mentioned, we had a war risk premium. However, let's look at today. 
because we have introduced competition within the port, waiting time for ships, I'm sure 90% of you will get it wrong, has reduced by six hours. Six hours. When SLT was privatized, prior to the privatization, Lanka Bell and Suntel were brought in and that was also structured by the BII. At that time, the waiting period for a telephone was two and a half years on average. Power sector PPPs happened during the time where there was a power crisis. Mini hydros were started and about 300 megawatts of private power were implemented. In the case of housing, housing was approached in, on a very structured basis. First, an, a demand assessment was made where the BOI hired NDB Investment Bank to do a demand assessment on middle income housing. Then the BOI encroached on land parcels of other government agencies and, had, and, and, and acquired those lands as free grants. The RFP was issued. Here's where the novelty comes in, which is really part of my topic. The RFP was not issued to the private sector or the, or the developers. The RFP was issued to banks. Why did we issue an RFP to a bank or to banks, 11 banks, for, for housing development? Very simple. We said, you find the developer that you are willing to finance. You create mortgage instruments to stimulate demand. Why we did that? The entire RFP was supported by research. And that is what I see lacking at the present moment. Is there adequate research being done to see where the demand is coming from for all what we are doing at the moment? So the bank stepped in, picked the two companies. Actually, that was the beginning of a fairly robust mortgage industry because mortgage, the mortgage industry was quite nascent at that time in the, in, in, in the late 1990s. Then when it came to the IT sector, I mentioned in my earlier uh, panel session about how we put a, a fiber optic cable on the entirety of the WTC. The Board of Investment funded it. Then when it was found that there was a shortage of IT professionals, the Board of Investment played the role of a venture capitalist, put in 30 million rupees to start SLIIT. Actually, if SLIIT was not a company limited by guarantee, which is not for profit, today it would be valued at over 5 billion, over five billion rupees. We could have plugged the government budget deficit, if it were, in fact, if the Board of Investment had taken equity. Nevertheless, there are ways that we can be creative to stretch the PPP model. Now, SLIIT effectively was a PPP, but the private sector element was the management, not the money. We flipped the whole idea. We set up an IT institute, a university, which is approved by the UGC, University Grants Commission, with private sector management and management principals, hiring them from places like University of Morotu, et cetera, paying them market rates. Um, the expressways. The current expressway that you drive on is, was actually created during the late 1990s, and it was in, the Katunayak Expressway was structured as a build, operate, finance, privatized project initially, where the contractor would come with finance, the road gets built, the tolls are, get established over a period of time, then we securitize it and privatize it, so that the government can recycle that money and put it into another highway or something else. So why can't we look at securitizing the toll road now? Take the money, go build the Candy Expressway. So when it comes to innovative business models, um, the, I think such models are being planned for Mattala Airport and um, the, the Hambantar Port, which are significant white elephants and drains on, on the treasury resources, where special purpose vehicles are potentially being created. New equity will be put into those special purpose vehicles by international companies. And then these assets would be transferred to those international, to, to that special purpose vehicle. The government will take the money, retire the loan that was taken, or some part of the loan. I don't think the entirety of the loan can be retired. So that, again, this improves the government's balance sheet. So I hope these, these initiatives are implemented very quickly. Finally, my final part is about Port City. Port City is a relatively simple PPP structure. The risk is allocated in a very just, justifiable and rational manner. The private investor, it's the FDI, undertakes the full commercial risk, investment risk, and marketing risk. It will provide all the internal infrastructure within the, uh, within the uh, uh, reclaimed area. The government will provide, the, provide all the uh, infrastructure up to the periphery of the site, including the roads and everything else, that power, water, sewerage, up to the periphery. And in return, the government gets 62 hectares of developable land and the further 91 hectares of public lands that will have about 45 hectares of parks, etc. 
Now, the 62 hectares of land that the government gets at today's value is worth over 2.5 billion US. Now, there have been lots of arguments about whether this is a justifiable structure, but if you calculate the overall economic benefits, future tax revenue, various other no entrepreneurial talent and new demand that, that Port City would attract, I, I believe that the economic justification for Port City is quite uh, apparent. Now, we can approach a similar model for Trincomalee development, which is now being master planned by Sabana, Candy, um, where we could potentially look at multiple stakeholders, master developers, it was mentioned earlier, coming in at the present stage. I do not believe we need to wait till all the beautiful plans are drawn out. We need to engage the private sector potential developers now so that we can hit the ground running. I believe the stage at which where I, I believe each new government is given two years to get their act right. It happened with the CBK government, it ha happened with the my Rajapaksa government. We have finished pretty much good part of one year, but there is a lot that needs to be done to ensure that the private sector will embrace whatever the RFPs that are being issued, but because these township developments are inherently complex, it requires creativity, it requires that we set up, not today, not tomorrow, but yesterday, a centralized PPP unit under, ideally, the Prime Minister's ministry, so that there is a core team of professionals who will prepare the RFPs, assist megapolis, assist the various line ministries, and have transaction advisors, the investment bankers, like Anarkali, on advising on every single transaction. So, I'd like to now end by stating that, you know, I sometimes, okay, I, I, I got, I sometimes do get quite concerned that if a bunch of us in our 20s and 30s at the time could have, during war years where we were not sure that, you know, whether the next day we were going to come back home alive, could have closed $800 million of transactions in today's environment, we should be looking at eight billion. We should be looking at at least five billion dollar transactions. Why? Because look at the level at which the world has progressed in the last 17 years. Look at the reserves of China, three trillion dollars. These, these monies are looking for places. And that's the reason we have a very large Chinese investment pipeline. Sovereign wealth funds have evolved. There's an Asian infrastructure bank that China promoted. Uh, we have large uh, private equity companies. So, so essentially, um, I would like to state that Sri Lanka is at a stage where we cannot fail. If we are not to fail this time around, we need to build institutional capacity. I mentioned the important institutions where capacity has to be built, BOI, uh, tourist board, UDA, et cetera. We need to be demand driven as much as possible, and wherever the demand is not there, we need to work towards creating demand. And that is why the, the title of my speech is PPPs, but nevertheless, uh, I'd like to say that they have complex, inherently complex. The SAGT project had 1,600 pages of legal documentation, and that is why the government needs to attract new types of skills who are creative enough to realize the vision that Megapolis has presented to you over the last day or two. Thank you very much. LBR LBO Infrastructure Summit 2016